The other day, a friend of mine asked me, Matt, do you have any idea how lucky we are? I thought about it, and I'm not even sure I'm capable of understanding how lucky I am. Let me tell you a story. My name is Matt Hells. Over the past two years, I have worked with the Cora Blue Fund on some amazing charitable projects in a remote community in southern Kenya near one of the most iconic and beautiful places in Africa, the Masai Mara National Reserve, which borders the Serengeti National Park in Tanzania. If you know anyone who has been on an African safari, then chances are good it was in that region of the continent. It is a land of extremes, extreme wildlife and landscapes, extreme beauty and extreme danger. It's also a place to see extreme wealth right next to extreme poverty. Many of the exotic, luxurious bush camps cost anywhere from $600 to $2,000 per night per person. And yet, only a few miles away, you can see extreme poverty, where most people earn around $5 a day. On my most recent trip, I ventured into the nearby town of Logorian to explore the local culture more and gain a better understanding of the Maasai people. It was on this trip that I discovered something I certainly did not expect to find in a place of so much poverty. Rumors of gold. No other word evokes visions of wealth and power as gold. It plays a powerful role in almost every culture on earth. So when I found out the parents of the students at the school we are building are spending their days mining for gold, my curiosity was piqued. I'm not talking about large scale corporate mining, I'm talking about artisan miners. People who use the most basic tools and resources to mine gold right out of their own backyards. It seemed impossible. Could this little tourist village have a big gold secret? I had to see it for myself. So I asked a few of my local friends if they would take me to the mines. What I found in those small mines in Kenya was not riches and luxury. What I found was people busting their butts and risking their lives just to make about $5 a day. And to earn that tiny income, they must endure extremely dangerous conditions, be exposed to multiple health hazards, deal with violence, and do back-breaking manual labor all day. The first thing I saw when we drove into camp were dozens of ponds. There were young women sifting crushed rock with water. The sediment is washed down over a cloth, and the heavier gold and dirt settled to the bottom. Then they remove the remaining sediment and move into the amalgamation process in which the young women handle mercury with their bare hands. This stuff is just as toxic as arsenic. The mercury grabs onto the small particles of gold and separates it from the dirt to form a tiny ball of mercury and gold. The mercury is then burned off, leaving them with pure gold. I've since come to find out that most third world countries use this process in small scale mining operations, which accounts for over 20% of the gold mined in the world today. Most have no access to safety equipment, let alone any money to afford it. At this point, ethically, I knew I was not going to be buying any gold. However, I began to wonder if there was something I might be able to do to help. First, I wanted to see the actual mine shafts. So we headed down the road about a half a mile and out into a field where six different mine shafts were being mined. What I saw there were young men using mining techniques that had not been used in the United States since the early 1800s. They are digging down into these mines over 100 feet deep and they're using tree branches as rudimentary support systems. These mine shafts are unbelievably dangerous, and if you suffer from any claustrophobia, this is your worst nightmare. The young men in the mines are using nothing more than hammers and chisels, except for when the rock is too hard. They will drill down into the rock and place explosives, and then excavate the debris by hand, one bucket at a time. When I saw how bad the dust got during the blasting process, I was heart-wrenched. And you can see and you imagine how much dust has gone to the lungs. Yeah. This is why Ma Matt is saying that he's going to try as, as much as he can to get some mask and then also helmet and then safety gears for his ears, for, uh, gum boots and also gloves for his hands. Look yeah. at that. Oh my God, he needs some assistance and I think soon. How old are you? Me? Yeah. 30 years, 30 years old. He's 30 years old. These boys work hard in dangerous conditions alternating shifts night and day. 
What I didn't see was any sort of safety equipment. No dust masks, no earplugs, no glasses, nothing. These are fun-loving boys with a great sense of humor. I have since made friends with quite a few of them. As they continue to share their story with me, I realize these men are from the same families of the children we've been helping at the boarding school Olopiki Dongwe down the street. This is a small town where everyone knows everyone. In fact, it is fairly likely that a lot of the young boys at the school may end up working at these same gold mines someday. After the rock is excavated from the mine, it is taken to the rock crushers. Workers, usually women, will spend all day crushing large rocks into smaller rocks by hand. Then those smaller rocks are loaded into a rock crusher that tumbles the rocks among steel balls to pulverize the rock into powder. The sound from these rock crushers is so loud that it can be heard from half a mile away. People and children standing right next to them as they work with no air protection. The sound from the crushers is so ear piercing that it's hard to describe. Imagine throwing large steel balls and rocks into your dryer and turning it on. The noise levels coming from these machines is way louder than that. The good news is, this is the part of the gold mine tour when I actually got excited. I had inadvertently packed an extra 50 pair of earplugs in my luggage. I now had a starting point. My friend Linus and I returned to my camp and retrieved the earplugs. We came back to the gold processing camp and immediately began to distribute the earplugs. It was such an amazing experience watching Linus distribute and demonstrate how to use the earplugs. And the reaction from the miners was so positive I knew I was absolutely committed to do more. Welcome sir. You are really appreciating everything. You are really appreciated. You are really welcome. Try to help us because this is what we are doing for the living. There is no other way we can avoid it. But if you can just get some protection to help us continue with the work and then we are not affected with anything, then it will be, it will be great. Another friend of mine asked me, why do they do it? All of the risk, all of that hard work, for just dollars a day. The simple answer, poverty. Little to no economic opportunity means if you don't work, you don't eat. There is no government subsidies, no welfare programs assisting these people out here. With the little they have, family and friends step in to try to assist as much as they can. Poverty drives some of the world's poorest people to accept any level of risk to mine this gold. With such a tiny amount of income from gold mining, there is no money left over to spend on safety equipment. Before returning back to the States, I was able to find a mining supply shop in Nairobi where I spent the remaining amount of my travel budget on two boxes worth of safety gear and had it shipped back out to the Mara. It is my intent that this is just the beginning. Since returning to the States, I've been working with a few close friends and my brother Dave to come up with a plan. We're calling it the Farmers of Gold Project. Because these men and women are literally farming the land for gold. My goal is to first immediately provide these 480 plus miners with all the safety gear they require. I'm heading back to Africa in less than two weeks and I want to take as much gear as I can with me. The rest I will purchase in Africa. If this feels like a project you would like to support, I'm making it as easy as possible with links in the description to our Elefundo fundraising site, Venmo, and even an Amazon wedding registry modified specifically for this project. If you're a Prime member, it will get to me fast. Currently, we are working to team up with the United Nations, who has recently launched a campaign to stop the use of mercury in gold mining. Looking towards a sustainable future, we are already looking at ways to create self-sustaining programs such as creating jewelry out of gold and selling it as charity gold, with the extra proceeds going directly to buy new safety gear. This is the beginning of another truly amazing adventure. I would absolutely love to have you involved.